All right, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for coming to the Adobe Premiere Pro Color Correction Workshop. Uh, my name is Francis. I work on the Premiere Pro team. I'm on the color team specifically. My background is I was a professional video editor and colorist for about 10 years before joining Adobe. So I'm bringing that expertise to help try to make color correction in Premiere Pro as cool as it can be. So here's a brief overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, correction versus grading, what's the difference? Why are, do we have these two terms? Basic correction workflow, how to get your exposure, white balance and contrast looking good, shot matching, including the brand new Adobe Sensei powered shot matching technology, which we just released. Creative grading, which is giving your footage a more creative uh, look. Little bit of color theory is gonna go hand in hand with that. Of course, what's the deal with orange and teal? Many of you guys have heard about this orange and teal color correction scheme, so I'm gonna teach you how to do that and why it's so popular. Part of that's gonna be some tips and tricks while grading, creative looks and presets, how to give your footage a creative look quickly without having to do all the work manually by yourself. Uh, and then some more advanced stuff, selective adjustments, which is when you're affecting just part of the image. And of course, some uh, fancy tricks if we have time. So I shot a little project. I'm from San Francisco and I shot a little thing. Thank you. We have some Bay Area natives. Uh, I shot a little thing about the Golden Gate Bridge and I think that this is going to be fairly cool for you guys to see. Let's just watch it. It's about three minutes. Hello, I'm in San Francisco, California, and I am standing right underneath possibly one of the most photographed landmarks in the entire world. And of course, we're talking about San Francisco's Golden Gate Bridge. I would like to take you on a little tour of some of the sites right around here that I like to go to.
Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we're gonna be using some of the footage from my little Golden Gate Bridge project to show you guys some of these tricks. So let's start right out with correction versus grading. What's the difference? Uh, I like to think of correction as the science and grading as the art. In correction, we're fixing problems like exposure, contrast, and white balance. And ultimately, you're trying to make it look good to your eye, make it look natural as if that's what it looks like in the real world. In grading, this is more creative. This is where you are giving your footage a creative look and ultimately you are controlling your viewers' emotions with the use of color. So let's talk about the basic correction workflow. Uh, it turns out that the human eye is way more sensitive to light than it is to color. So many professional colorists will tell you that it's more accurate to judge exposure and contrast in black and white. So what that means is just turn the saturation all the way down to set your exposure and your contrast. Uh, part of dialing in that contrast might be using something that's called an S-curve, and I'm gonna show you what that is and how to do it. And then once you have exposure and contrast dialed in in black and white, you're gonna bring the saturation back up until it feels right and then you're gonna adjust white balance and then you're gonna match shots to each other. So uh, let's jump right into Premiere Pro and look at what that looks like. So I've got a couple of clips on my timeline that need some work. And I'm noticing that the projector is not gonna be the best way to judge, so you're gonna have to take my word for it. It's a little washed out, it's not super high contrast, but we'll do what we can with this. So this shot is fairly low contrast, fairly gray, and it needs some help. So the first thing I'm gonna do is jump into the color workspace. You notice these tabs up along the top. Those are going to configure your workspace in a way that's optimized for that operation. So the first thing it does is it opens up the Lumetri color panel. That's our bread and butter, we need that. And the other thing is it opens up the scopes so that you can measure your video in a scientific manner, and I'll, I'll talk a little about, about the scopes. Another thing that it does for us is it enables this mode called Selection Follows Playhead. And all that means is that it automatically selects the clip that's under the playhead. And so you can see as I'm moving the playhead, the clip that's under it automatically gets selected. Uh, that's very helpful, and I recommend that you leave it on, but if you don't like it, some people don't, you can turn it off in the sequence menu up here. Selection falls playhead. But again, I recommend you leave it on. So following our basic correction workflow, I am going to go into the basic correction section of Lumetri and I'm gonna just dial the saturation all the way down to make a black and white image. And here, you can see that it's very gray, right? So what do we need to do to expand the contrast? Well, there is a contrast slider. So that, if I pull it all the way to the right, it's gonna make my highlights brighter and my shadows darker, and that's what contrast is, the difference between your very brightest part and your very darkest part. So I would say that pushing this all the way to 100 still isn't enough, and here's a little secret about these sliders. You can continue pushing them past 100. So you can grab the uh, numbers and continue to slide them even past 100. So that is going to be good to know about. So this is a start. Let's look at our scopes. I'm gonna look at the waveform scope over here on the left, and what this is doing is this is measuring light. So zero would be black, and 100 would be white. And you wanna keep your luminance in between zero and 100. If you go below zero, you're crushing the blacks and there's no more detail. There's no point to go below zero. Uh, and above 100, 
same thing. You're going to blast out your whites. You're no longer going to have detail in the highlights. So at this point, I'm going to continue using some more controls to try to keep expanding this contrast. Let's grab the shadow slider and drag that down to make the shadows darker. And the highlights, I can grab the highlight slider and push that up to make the highlights brighter. So all of that is basically adding contrast to the image. So this is where we were and this is where we are. Let's dial the saturation up. So I'm basically just going to push the saturation until it feels right, right? I'm going for a pretty vibrant look. So I'm going to say, yeah, right around here. So once again, this is where we started and that's where we ended up. I think this image has a lot more pop, it has a lot more vibrance, and it's more interesting to look at. Uh, now let's talk about white balance. In this shot, it's kind of hard to judge a white balance because typically you want to look at something that is neutral in your shot, something that's white or gray. In this case, uh, there's really nothing to go on, so we're just going to eyeball it, basically. I think it needs to be a little bit warmer, so I'm just going to push the temperature to the right. And there we go. So let me just zoom in here. So I'm, I'm grabbing the temperature slider and pushing that to the right, but not too much. OK, so that's it for that shot. Let's go to another shot. Uh, this one didn't actually make it into my cut. This is my friend Luke. He's actually a really talented motion graphics artist in San Francisco, and he, he let me borrow his car, essentially. <laughs> Which is to say that he drove me around. Uh, he's a great guy. So again, I'm going to dial the saturation down, and I think that the exposure overall needs to come up. Zoom in here. There we go. The exposure overall needs to come up a bit. And more contrast. And let's, let's call that good. Now let's dial the saturation back up until it feels right. You know, somewhere right around there. And you can tell that it looks fairly blue, right? So this would, on face value, it would look like a white balance problem. So we could grab the white balance selector and sample his gray hoodie. But there's a problem. Yeah, it made the gray hoodie gray, but that's actually really not right for this shot. And so this is sort of an example of trust your eye more than the technology, because making it correct is not always the right thing to do. So in this case, I'm going to back off from what the white balance, automatic white balance selector told me to do and kind of split the difference. OK, so we went from this. And that, I think, is a much more vibrant shot. Uh, let's talk about curves, because we're talking about contrast. I'm going to redo this uh, bridge shot uh, using a different method. So I'm going to reset it. By the way, uh, these buttons up here, this is the uh, reset, the Lumetri effect. If you get way off in the left field and you just want to start over, uh, this button right here is going to be cool. And believe it or not, we just introduced this. It seems like a no-brainer, that one and also this uh, effects bypass. This is where I've been turning it on and off. Uh, these are brand new, and they should have been there like 15 years ago. <laughs> so that that's actually an example of the kind of thing that I bring to the table. I'm like, hey, guys, we should put the buttons up there because it would be really easy. And then they're like, duh. <laughs> OK, but actually, I didn't design that feature. Anyway, let's talk about curves. Uh, so I'm going to jump into the curves section here. Let's see if I can, yeah, OK. And we're going to dial in an S curve. 
NS curve basically is I'm going to reduce the shadows and I'm going to pump up the highlights. And it's called an S curve because it kind of looks like an S. This is a really, really common way that colorists use to add contrast to the shot. And in fact, I like this way a lot better than messing with the uh, basic section controls because you can kind of do everything all at once, right? You can drop down your shadows, and I'm like, oh, that's affecting the highlights. Let's bring the highlights up. Maybe that made the shadows come up too much. OK, so right around here is good. And you can kind of push it and play it all within one tool. So uh, don't be scared of the curves. This is a really great tool. And I think you can see that it's, in fact, a little bit faster than using all those sliders. But hey, use whatever's comfortable to you. If those sliders make sense, use the sliders. Or use both, you know? There's uh, nothing that says you can't combine things. So yes, that's curves. And next on our list, we're going to talk about shot matching. So once we balance out individual shots, we're going to need to try to, to make them match each other, right? And so like, for example, I've got this shot here, the Golden Gate Bridge, and this shot here. And they look somewhat different, right? This one is a bit green. Uh, this one is more blue, a little bit more on the magenta side. Uh, what can we do to make these look more similar? Well, I would say in this case, let the computer do the work. And we introduced a brand new automatic shot matching feature, which I'm going to show you now. So right here on the program monitor button bar is this new button. It's called comparison view. And what that does is it brings us into this side-by-side uh, -side view. So what are we looking at here? On the right side is the current shot. That is the shot that is under the playhead. So whatever we choose. And on the left is the reference shot. And the reference shot we can select with this slider here. This has access to the entire timeline. Or you can use these edit point uh, jumper buttons. Or you can also scrub on this time code. Or in fact, just type in a time code if you happen to know the time code. In this case, I'm going to park it on this shot because uh, these are the ones that we want to compare. And this is actually a really good way to see that they don't match. So how can we fix that? I'm going to jump into the color wheels and match. So in the color wheels and match section, it used to just be called color wheels. But since we added the match technology, it's now called color wheels and match. And I'm going to turn off face detection for right now. I'll get back to what that is and why it's cool. But I'm just going to hit apply match. And it's going to analyze the colors on the left and analyze the colors on the right, figure out what's different about it, and then match them. And so in this case, I think it did a pretty decent job. We went from this to this. It's somewhat subtle, but that's what color correction is all about. It's the subtleties, because our eye is going to pick up on it like that, that it's wrong. And even if it only takes a slight little adjustment to make it right, we're going to do that. So I'm going to show you some other ways to look at these shots and compare them. So right now I'm in the side-by-side -side view, but let's go into a vertical split. This way, you can compare the shots sort of in context. This is a sort of a technique called onion skinning. So Doing this, we can actually see that these shots don't, in fact, match perfectly. Even after the uh, you know, insanely smart machine learning Adobe Sensei magic that's going on under the hood, these shots don't match perfectly. And you know, I want to give you guys an honest representation of what this technology can do and show you how to fix it. So 
At this point, this is actually kind of where our technology is set apart from some of our competitors. Because in other of our competition software, they dial in what we like to call a black box effect, which is you hit match, it performs the match, and if it does a good job, great. If it doesn't, you're kind of just hosed. You know, you can't fix it, you can't do anything about it. Uh, with this, we actually dial the settings necessary to do the match right into the color wheels. So you can continue to finesse and fine tune that adjustment if you need to. And in this case, yeah, I, I think that we probably need to add a little bit of magenta uh, to the midtones. In fact, I think we need to up the saturation entirely on the shot. Yeah, basically that's it. That little tweak took it from pretty good to darn near exact. Now, when you play these back one after another, uh, they're going to look like they belong together. Look like they were shot with the same camera on the same day. Uh, okay, let's talk about face detection. Uh, so we're still talking about shot matching, but let's see what that face detection button does for us. So I've got these two shots, and this one on the left uh, looks pretty different from the one on the right. The one on the right is fairly blue and needs a lot of work to match this shot. So again, I'm gonna jump into the comparison view mode. By the way, there's also a button in the color wheels section, which will open up the comparison view mode. Those things do exactly the same thing. So I'm gonna select my reference shot, this uh, me on the left. And I'm gonna turn face detection off for right now and just hit apply match and, and see what happens. So let me zoom in on that. I would say it did a terrible job. Uh, it made the shot on the left super blue, and it, it doesn't even remotely match. Uh, why is that? Well, look at all this blue sky on the left. You know, the computer doesn't know anything about the context of what's in the shot. You know, our human brain does. Like, oh, there's tons of blue in this shot, not a lot of blue in this shot. Clearly, I need to add tons of blue to this shot to make them match. Well, that's, in fact, wrong, right? So let's reset this, and let's do it again with that face detection button turned on. This time, it's gonna match them way closer. And so what it's actually doing, what the face detection is doing, this is the Adobe Sensei like machine learning, uh, super smart part of auto matching. It's analyzing uh, the shot on the left, it's finding my face, it's analyzing the shot on the right, it's finding my face, and then it's just using the colors that it finds in those facial regions to perform the match. And this is kind of what our brains automatically do, you know? We like look at faces and that's what we care about. The blue sky in the background is not all that important. You know, the multicolored uh, backdrop is not all that important. It's, it's about the skin tone. The skin tone needs to match. Uh, yeah, so this is the auto match technology powered by Adobe Sensei, probably TM. Okay, what's next on our agenda? This is where it gets uh, a little bit fun, right? Because we're gonna talk about grading. Remember, grading is the creative part of the process. This is where you are giving it a mood, and ultimately you are affecting your audience's emotions with the use of color. So let's talk just a little bit about color theory. And uh, this is pretty much the easiest way to understand it, right? Which is that certain colors are commonly associated with certain emotions. You know, it, everyone knows that blue kind of is, equates to sadness and yellow and more warm tones equate to more joy. Now, I wouldn't exactly recommend that if you wanna make your audience fearful that you color correct your piece purple. I don't think that's gonna work out for you, but 
this is something to keep in mind. Okay, so let's jump back into Premiere Pro and look at some creative grading. Okay, so what I have here is my entire timeline and I have gone through and balanced out the shots, I've done shot matching, I've fixed problems with exposure and contrast, and now I wanna give it a look. So here's where I'm going to recommend the use of adjustment layers. And an adjustment layer is simply a layer that you can add. Anything you put on that layer will affect anything underneath it. So I'm gonna make it right here, by the way, this new item button right there. I'm gonna click on it, accept the defaults, that's fine. And I'm going to drag and put it on my timeline and extend it out the length of the timeline. Notice that I've got these graphics. These are above the adjustment layer because I don't want the graphics to be affected by the color that I'm gonna put on the adjustment layer. So now it's time to find a hero shot. A hero shot is something that kind of represents the look and feel of your piece. So I'm gonna say my face. Cause like a lot of YouTubers, you know, they point the camera at themselves and I wanted to try and do the same thing. And one of the things I learned by doing this is uh, I would be a terrible YouTuber. Uh, so thanks for indulging me. So let's go and make this shot super sad. So I'm gonna dial the saturation down and I am going to go into the color wheels and just basically push everything blue. And I'm gonna add a vignette. And you know, you can see that in a matter of like 10 seconds, I took this shot to a whole different feeling. And if I hit play here and we look at how it's affecting some of these other shots, you can see that it's a whole different ballpark. You know, this is a sad, somber piece. That's actually not at all where I wanted to take this piece. So let me undo that and let's take it a different direction. So I'm gonna go into the creative tab. There are some pre-made presets in here that can get you started quickly. So I'm gonna click on this button here and we can kind of cycle through some of the presets that ship default with the product. So I know of one that I like, which is this Fuji Eterna. It gives it a sort of a warm, low contrast, kind of Instagram-y, hipster-y look. And it's also kind of dreamy and nostalgic, and I like that. You know, that's kind of what this is for me. You know, I grew up in the Bay Area, and the Golden Gate Bridge is one of those, like, things that I look at with pride. Like, yes, this is my hometown. Okay, so also I'm going to add a vignette. In this case, the vignette is not so much making it sad as it's just focusing the attention inwards, and vignettes are great. So obviously that's way too much, right? Uh, vignettes should be kind of subtle, I think. And because I did this on an adjustment layer, it is transferring that look to every clip in my project. And what's cool about that is if you go and change your mind about what this is supposed to look like, uh, you can do it once and it affects every clip in your project. Well, in your timeline anyway. And more specifically, just the clips that are underneath the adjustment layer. Uh, next, I wanna take a little detour from Premiere Pro and talk about a product that Adobe is just getting ready to launch called Project Rush. You guys have probably seen a lot about it. But this is all of the power inside of Premiere Pro, <clears throat> inside a greatly simplified, uh, much easier to use format. So this is my dog, Bella. She's a four pound chihuahua. And I'm gonna show you how to do some color correction in Rush. Click on the color tab. You can choose some presets or you can go into the edit tab and <clears throat> dial in whatever you want. And this is gonna start to look pretty darn familiar to you, I think, coming right from Premiere. So you can shoot on your phone, you can edit on your phone, 
and then you can sync it through Creative Cloud to Rush on the desktop. And you can even then open that Rush project up in Premiere if you need more control. So uh, check out Project Rush. Uh, it's in beta right now. Uh, follow this link and you can join the beta program if you'd like. And there's more info about Rush uh, just outside the door here if you want to follow up on that. Let's talk about complementary colors. Uh, complementary colors are color lighting schemes or correction schemes where the colors are opposite each other on the color wheel. So green and magenta, for example, look really good together because it's a maximum amount of color contrast. Red and cyan is another one. Of course, I know that the Golden State Warriors' uh, official colors are gold and blue, not yellow and blue, but I couldn't help myself. But really, teal and orange is the complementary color scheme that everyone goes nuts for. So what's up with teal and orange? Skin tones tend to be in the orange range and blue or teal being the complement of orange, it makes uh, people and skin tones really pop out. And also it's found in nature. So our eye, our brain looks at it and it seems natural to us. Think about like a golden sunset with blue shadows. So let's jump back into Premiere and look at teal and orange. Okay, so I've got a couple of clips on my timeline. And once again, I am going to add an adjustment layer, accept the defaults, I'm gonna put it on there, extend the length of my timeline, and make sure that that's selected. I'm gonna jump into the color wheels section, and teal and orange is pretty much as simple as push the midtones towards orange and push the shadows towards blue. And what to do with the highlights? It uh, depends on your content, but in this instance, I am going to use it to reinforce the midtones because my face is pretty bright. Uh, it, at other times, you might actually push it towards blue to uh, neutralize the highlights, but I'm gonna make it orange. So there you go. Orange midtones, blue shadows, that's teal and orange. So we went from that to that. Next, let's talk about selective adjustments. So we're starting to get into a little bit more advanced territory. A selective adjustment is when you are affecting just part of the image, and you can do that with HSL secondaries, which I'll get into what those are. Uh, sometimes masks, and if you're talking about masks, keyframing and tracking kind of go hand in hand with that. So let's jump back into Premiere and look at selective adjustments. Okay, so I've got this shot here of me. Uh, I forgot to wear sunscreen that day. So I guess the, uh, the first lesson of color correction is to wear sunscreen because <laughs> you're gonna have to end up like color correcting your red face, right? So wear sunscreen. Uh, so we're gonna start using the scopes to evaluate my skin tone in a more scientific manner. So let's look at the vector scope over here. The vector scope is measuring color and there are color targets on here that if something is, is uh, sort of moving towards that target, that's the color that it is. So we can see that we've got a lot of blue in this shot, or sort of like blue teal, uh, and something, this, uh, something po pointing right towards red. I'm gonna guess that's my face. Uh, but what we need to do is isolate my face so that we can just work on that. So I'm gonna jump into the effects control panel up here and under opacity, I'm gonna make a mask. And simply, I'm just gonna put it over my face. And it doesn't need to be perfect because this is temporary. Okay, and so now with my face totally isolated, I can in fact see that, yeah, it's, it's red, 
Uh, so what do we do to fix that? I'm going to go into the color wheels over here. Let's see if I can zoom in so we can see the scope, my face, and the color wheels. OK. Skin tone generally falls in the mid-tone region, so I am going to push the mid-tones. There's a line on this vector scope. This is the skin tone line, right? It's right here, sort of two-thirds of the way from yellow to red. And this is a sort of a recommendation for where skin tone should land. And this is, in fact, uh, appropriate for all ethnicities. If it's pointing towards red, I am basically going to grab the midtones and I am going to basically push it until that blob kind of lands on that line. Oh, it's like almost right off the screen. There we go. So can you see that? Uh, it's a fairly subtle adjustment, but it's going to mean the difference between like me being embarrassed and having a red face or it looking like, you know, a supermodel, I hope. Uh, OK, so that was a pretty easy thing. The rest of the skin tone recipe that I like to use is push the shadows a little bit towards red. This simulates kind of like blood flow under the skin. And the highlights, we're going to push towards whatever the highlight color in the shot is. So in this case, I would say blue. It's kind of like my shiny forehead reflecting the blue sky. So just a bit. And you guys probably can't even see on that screen because it's like I'm making very small adjustments. But these small adjustments are going to make it look awesome. So what did we do? We went from that to that. Yeah, that's subtle. Uh, but of course, you know, th this isn't going to work. You know, my, my face cut out uh, like that. Let's go into the effects controls. And I'm going to delete that opacity mask because we don't need it anymore. So I just right click, select clear on that mask. And now the problem is that maybe my face looks a bit better, but it kind of destroyed the rest of the shot. The rest of the shot now is looking green. To counteract that red, I had to add green. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a mask on the Lumetri color effect itself. So right over here under Lumetri color, I can click the ellipse mask tool and place it on my face and extends the shape. And here's where I actually need to be a little bit more accurate. So I'm going to follow the contour of my face. And I am going to add some feathering. This control point up here, uh, that is adding feathering. So there's not like a hard line. So basically what this is doing is it is containing the effect of the Lumetri color just within that mask. And that's what I want to do. But of course my face is moving. So now I need to keyframe this mask to track along with the movement of my head. So over here in the effects control panel, I'm going to toggle on animation for that mask. You see it made a keyframe there. And I'm going to back up a, you know, a few seconds. And I'm going to place the mask on my face again. Let's back up a little bit more. And this is the manual tracking method, which sometimes is totally fine. You're just you know, going a, a, you know, a second or so at a time and then just moving it. And it'll take care of the in-between frames and track this right along. Uh, but there is, in fact, an automatic way to track masks. And that is right here, these controls, track selected mask forward. So I'm going to go ahead and click that. And now it's going to automatically advance a frame at a time. And it's going to track this very precisely all by itself. The one thing is it is, in fact, a little slow. So I would recommend uh, that if you don't need to use the automatic tracking and you can get by just doing it by hand, do that. Or hit tracking and go get some coffee. So it's done. And we can see that, yeah, that looks better. OK, so that's skin tone.
and masks and manual keyframing and tracking. Let's look at some more selective adjustment challenges. So in this shot, I don't know if you guys have these bikes down here, but in San Francisco they have these uh, e-bikes and they are just like screaming day glow red. Like I swear I didn't do anything to this shot. This is really what these bikes look like. Uh, they're like ridiculous. I guess it's safe or whatever, but um, I think they're terrible. Actually, they're kind of fun. Uh, so there's a couple of ways to control this. I mean, this is really distracting, and I would say that if you were using this footage as is, the audience's eyes are just going to be like immediately pulled to those bikes. And if they're the center of attention, then that's cool. But if they're not, if they're just in the background, it would be cool to de-emphasize them. So there's a couple ways to do that. I'm gonna go back into the curves and we're gonna look at the hue saturation curve. Okay, cool. And the hue saturation curve is we're gonna make a selection, that's the hue part of it. So I'm gonna just select a preset of red and then saturation, by dragging it down, we're desaturating that red hue. And you notice that it really doesn't affect the rest of the image all that much. I mean, it actually, it does a bit, so you gotta be careful, like this lady's face is now, it's looking kind of not so cool. Um, so you have to be kind of careful with these kind of adjustments. Uh, really analyze your frame and make sure that stuff is still looking, uh, still looking cool. So that's one way to do it. The other is the HSL secondaries. So let me click on that section here. And what does HSL stand for? That is hue, saturation, luminance. So we're using those three parameters in conjunction with each other to create a selection. Uh, it's kind of like green screening, actually. So I'm gonna use this eyedropper tool here and I'm gonna just select this red color. Uh, by the way, uh, double clicking any parameter will reset it to zero. Uh, just that individual one parameter. So yes, double click to reset. Okay, if I click on this button here, it's gonna show me the selection only. So kind of toggling this on and off, I can see that I haven't gotten a super awesome selection going, like it's missing the inside of the basket. So I can get those by clicking on this plus tool and I'm just gonna kinda start where it's bright, hold and drag and select all of this range from bright all the way down to dark. Uh, now, when I look at my selection, I can see that it's a much better selection and let's see what else I selected. The lady's face was being uh, messed up in that previous method, but here it's not. So this might be a more appropriate a method for desaturating these particular bicycles. I think that that red is her hood, and uh, so that's cool, I'll bring that down too. So now whatever we do in the HSL secondary is gonna apply only to that little region. So I'm gonna desaturate it, and I'm also going to just sort of bring the illumination. We went from this to that. Uh, you know, you can use this for fixing blue skies, for example, or if there's like a red stop sign uh, behind your scene and it's super distracting, or you know, an ugly purple Barney van or whatever, you know, uh, you can deal with that. So, I have a little bit of time left. Let's talk about some fancy tricks, some fancy colorist tricks. Uh, so, in this shot, it's fine, but it was a kind of a gray day and I wish that the sky was more blue. So I'm going to show you guys how to fake a graduated filter. Uh, anyone who's done photography maybe has used graduated filters where it's basically a colored piece of glass that you put in front of your lens uh, that has a, a gradient on it. I'm gonna show you how to fake that. So down here, new item, I'm gonna make a graphic and I'm gonna dump it on top of this clip, and now I'm gonna jump into the graphics 
uh, workspace. And you're probably thinking, uh, what is this guy doing with graphics? This is a color correction workshop, right? Well, we'll you know, stick with me, we'll get there. Uh, I'm gonna make a new layer, a new rectangle, in fact, and I'm just gonna make it the size of the whole frame. Okay, so we're done, and I showed you how to make a totally gray frame. <laughs> Joking. I'm gonna fill it with a linear gradient. I'm gonna make the color on the left be a sort of a deep dark blue. The color on the right is going to be a sort of a baby blue, like a sky blue. And up here are the opacity controls. I'm gonna make it transparent on the right-hand side. So it's going from opaque blue to transparent kind of sky blue. And now you're probably starting to see where I'm going with this crazy thing. You can use the on-screen controls to control the shape of the gradient. And then really the icing is to change the blending mode of this graphic. So what blending modes are in the effects control panel under opacity, I'm gonna change this to overlay. And basically that just adds the colors in a really a nice subtle way rather than being totally opaque. Uh, so yeah, we went from that to that. And you know, again, it's a bit subtle, but this is going to make all the difference, you know? It's a blue sky versus a gray sky. So I have some other examples. Uh, just like any good cooking show, I've got some cool gradients pre-made. Uh, this one, let's just drop it on the footage, is an example of doing a sort of sky replacement and adding uh, some color to the ground. So you can have multiple gradient layers on that graphic. So it was like that, and now it's like that. And this is what the actual gradient layer itself looks like. And one more trick. Uh, I shot this stuff on a pretty gray day. I'm gonna do some sky replacement on this one. So this is just another graphic. And I can show you that it used to be sort of gray up there, and now it's blue. Again, a really subtle thing that is going to make all the difference. Bada boom, bada bing. So you can really, uh, you can really create some really cool stuff with that. So that basically wraps it up for the color workshop. Well, thank you very much.